So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to uh, the annual general meeting. This is the 85th annual general meeting of the British Institute for the Study of Iraq. Um, very pleased to welcome you here this evening. Uh, so as usual uh, at the uh, AGM, uh, we run through uh, a series of, of uh, adoptions of uh, minutes, annual report, and uh, elect the treasurer. Um, but before that, I'd just say, like to say a few words in terms of uh, past year's activity and where we're headed in the future. I think um, I need to start um, this evening with a very somber note. Um, we have to record here the, our deep sadness um, uh, at the, the very sudden death of Dr. Lamia al Galani Ware in uh, 18th of January in Amman in Jordan. Uh, this is a, uh, the news, of course, was a terrible blow to many people, um, uh, particularly the Institute for which she has been spent many, many years. Uh, she's been a, she was a particular friend of the Institute and indeed was an uh, honorary lifetime member. Um, many of you will know Lamia. Um, she was awarded in 2009 the Institute's highest honour, the Gertrude Bell Memorial Gold Medal, um, the fifth recipient of the medal since uh, the first award to Professor Sir Max Malouin. So a highly respected individual. I'd just like to read a few words from um, the, uh, the, the words that are on our website, and I would invite you to um, uh, go to the website and, and read those in more detail. Um, but just to give you a sense of, of Lamia's contribution to the Institute, when she was awarded the medal, uh, Professor Roger Matthews cited in particular her unceasing efforts and invaluable advice and energies in sustaining academic and personal links between scholars in the UK and Iraq. Her continuing input into BC's highly active visiting scholars program has been fundamental to its great success in recent years, providing training and experience to a broad range of Iraqi colleagues who have taken their enhanced skills back to Iraq. Uh, Professor Matthews noted that Dr. Lamia al Galani Ware was a ray of intense and brave light in an age of darkness and difficulty, and she will be sorely missed by us all. That mention of the visiting Iraqi Scholars Program that Lamia was so instrumental in supporting um, is one of our great initiatives. Um, we have been hugely successful in bringing colleagues from Iraq uh, to this country and in many ways we are very keen to um, maintain uh, Lamia's legacy by uh, providing more opportunities and so the Visiting Scholars Programme is something that is at the heart of our activities and indeed at the heart of our fundraising programme. In addition, um, we have, of course, lots of other activities moving forward, um, not least uh, a major international conference uh, later this year, uh, between the 16th and 18th of September, um, the conference called The Jews of Iraq, Engagement with Modernities will take place at SOAS, the University of London. And of course, we hope you will all be present there. Um, if any of you would be interested in helping support that conference, of course, please do get in touch. Um, we welcome support in all uh, manners of ways, um, but we're very keen that this uh, conference uh, reflects the, the uh, wide-ranging activities um, that, uh, that uh, Dr. Al Galani Ware um, was deeply involved in through the Institute. So just with those initial thoughts, um, we'll move now to uh, the main business of the AGM, which is the uh, adoption of the minutes of the AGM held on the 14th of February. 2017. 
So I'd like to call um, for a, a, a member to move the adoption of the minutes of the 14th of February 2017, please. Thank you very much. And I'd now like to call uh, on a member to second that motion. Thank you. So um, I put the motion to adopt the minutes. I now would like to call on uh, a member to move the adoption of the annual report, and I hope you all have um, copies of those. They were available on the desk at the entrance, if you haven't already picked one up. So I'd like to, to move the adoption of the annual report and accounts for 2017-2018. So um, could I call on someone to... Thank you very much. And a member to second the motion. Thank you, sir. So I put the motion to adopt the annual report and accounts. I'd now like to introduce uh, Dr. Tim Clayton, who is our honorary treasurer, uh, to uh, uh, answer any questions regarding the accounts. I'm happy to take any questions people might have on the account. Uh, my suggestion would be the best summary is on pages 18 to 19 of the annual report, which rather highlights the key elements of the, um, the accounts, but happy to take questions. Um, in which case, could I ask a member to um, move the adoption for the independently examining final accounts for the period ending 30th of June 2018? And to second. Thank you. Um, we've just finished uh, the council meeting, and one of the issues we've been going through is uh, reviewing the appointment of our independent examiner. Um, for those of you who know about charity law, below a certain level of, of finances, rather than a full scale audit by a firm of accountants, you have an independent examiner, also an accountant. And we're just reviewing that. Um, and I'd like to ask uh, for authority for the council to take that process forward and if they feel appropriate to appoint a new uh, examining without having to come back to the AGM. Do I? And a seconder? Thank you. Uh, I think that's my part in the proceedings. So, in fact, uh, it's now my responsibility to call on a member to propose the re-election of our honorary treasurer, uh, Dr. Tim Claydon. So, I have uh, someone to propose the re-election of Dr. Claydon. Thank you very much. And a second? Thank you very much. So, I put the motion to elect the honorary treasurer. So, that very swiftly um, concludes um, the business of the AGM. Um, I therefore uh, like to move to the exciting part of the evening, which is um, this evening's lecture. And um, today's, this evening's lecture is Dr. Robert Killock. Uh, Dr. Killock is the co-director of the Carrick Spassanu project. He's been deeply involved in projects in Iraq for many years, not least through the British Institute for the Study of Iraq and the British School of Archaeology, before that in Baghdad, working on several field projects. His major excavation projects um, have been at ancient Saar in Bahrain, more recently at Tel Kheba near Ur, a major site which has really transformed our understanding, or transforming our understanding of the so-called Sealand dynasty in the second millennium BC, um, re rewriting history, and more recently uh, working at Charanak Svasanu as co-director. And indeed, it is on those excavations which promise equally to rewrite history that he will talk to us this evening. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Keller.
again. It's great. So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Paul. From Alexander to Al Tabari, recent investigations at Karak Spasinu, southern Iraq. We've been working at Karak Spasinu since 2016, and our main activities are listed here. We've produced a very detailed author mosaic map of the site, a sample of which you can see on the left-hand side of the screen. Okay. Our geophysical survey has covered to date approximately one square kilometer, and we've excavated a number of evaluation trenches to check the results of the geophysical survey. They've been, on the whole, quite small ones, just two by two meters, but we have on occasion managed to expand them and do a wider uh, area. The collection of surface artifacts that really speaks for itself. And last autumn... I'm too tall for this. Last autumn, we began a... Hold on, there we go. Last autumn, we began a geomorphological survey together with Dr. Jan Welstra of the Belgian Geological Survey with the aim of understanding the paleo environment around the site and in particular charting the ancient watercourses. And we have also been conducting a regional survey looking at sites in the area of Carax. And to date, we've identified over two dozen new sites. They are mostly mostly uh, dating to the Islamic period. I'm going to be talking tonight really about items two and three on that list. But first of all, I just want to show you where we are and provide some historical background to the city of Karak Spasinu. So Karak today is located roughly 40 kilometers northwest of Basra, up here. And it's quite close to the international border between Iraq and Iran, shown by this yellow line. That has had implications for the current state of preservation of the remains at Karax. Pretty much everything I'm going to show you tonight from the site dates to the first to third centuries AD. Uh, that's the second half of the Parthian period. It's also the second half of the Arsacid dynasty in Mesopotamia. But the history of Carax starts a few centuries earlier. In 324 BC, Alexander the Macedonian, or Alexander the Great, as he's known to us here in the West, was in southern Iraq, where he founded a new city called, like all the others, Alexandria. We have a very good account of this from Pliny the Elder, the Roman historian and admiral, in fact, who did not survive the eruption of Vesuvius in AD 79. He tells us that the site was built on an elevated position uh, above the confluence of the Tigris with the Euleus River. And the Euleus River is, today is thought to be an old bed of the Karun. Um, these days the Karun runs entirely within uh, Iran. He goes on to tell us that it was populated by uh, citizens from the nearby royal city of Doreen and by some of his veterans. And he provides a few other details um, about the size of the walls, and he also mentions a harbour that was located uh, some distance away from the city. After Alexander's death, uh, Carax Basinu became part of the Seleucid Empire. Pliny tells us that it was flooded at least twice. First of all, sometime in the middle of the 2nd century BC, when it was rebuilt and renamed by Antiochus IV, and again later on in the same century. 
The second time, it was rebuilt by Hispassanes, uh, after whom it gets its name, Carax Spassinu, the palisade of uh, Hispassanes. Now, Hispassanes is quite an interesting character. He starts off by being the local governor under the Seleucids of the satrapy of the Erythraean Sea, i.e. the Gulf. Around 140 BC, uh, in the midst of civil war and the impending dissolution of the eastern part of the Seleucid Empire, he declares himself independent and carves out a kingdom that stretches from Babylonia in the north at least as far as Bahrain down in the Gulf. He appears in a variety of historical sources, of which I'll just mention two from opposite ends of his kingdom. The Babylonian astronomical diaries mention him a few times, specifically a campaign he conducted against Elam, which was obviously successful because it ends with the words, there was panic in Elam, but happiness in Babylonia. And at the other end, Uh, from Tylos, i.e. modern Bahrain, there is a dedicatory inscription by the local governor to Hispassanes and his consort Thalassia. The the Babylonian astronomical diaries go on to record the death of Hispassanes and a very precise date, the 11th of June, 124 B.C., at the very ripe old age of 85. Now, following his death, or maybe shortly thereafter, Carax was incorporated into the Arsacid Empire. And it became part of the province of Messini, the geographical limits of which are shown here. There was a neighbouring province of Elamias to the northeast and Babylonia to the northwest, the desert towards modern Kuwait to the southwest, and, and the Gulf uh, providing the other limit. Under the Arsacids, Carax became the primary port of entry for goods coming by sea from the Indian subcontinent. Uh, some scholars have called this the first era of really truly globalized trade and Carax was an important node in this network. Uh, basically, the Han Dynasty had unified China and expanded into what is today Vietnam and Korea, and uh, confederations of nomads stretched from the Chinese border all the way into Afghanistan, and then there was Parthia, and further west, the rising power of Rome. So this meant that really for the first time, goods could travel uh, freely and profitably across this entire part of Eurasia. Many of the routes were by land, as you can see here. One ended up on the ports on the Arabian Sea, particularly Barigaza here and Barbaricon. From here, they were either shipped around the Arabian Peninsula, up the Red Sea, uh, across Egypt, into the Mediterranean, and on to Rome. But they also went up the Gulf to Carax, from which they were transhipped up to the imperial capitals at Tessiphon and Seleucia, and further west, particularly to Palmyra, and even down to Petra. The Periplus of the Erythraean Sea, written in the first century AD, actually gives us quite a good account of what goods and commodities were shipped through these ports and specifically talks about Barigaza, and it mentions oils and resins, semi-precious stones, silk, of course, which was in great demand in Rome, cloths, hardwoods, uh, ivory, and many of these commodities would actually probably have gone through Carax. So we know that at Carax at this time, there was a really thriving trading community, Particularly, uh, it had close connections with Palmyra. Many of the caravan records from that city mention caravans that were going to and from Carax. And we know that there was actually a colony of Palmyrenian traders resident in that city. And the apocryphal Acts of Thomas 
actually describes Carax as the place where the merchants of the East meet. So, this wonderful entrepot, which today looks like this at ground level. Not very inspiring, I know, after the picture I built up. But, uh, in fact, I'd say it's probably one of the most unscenic places I've ever worked in. It's flat, it is very saline, and in autumn, as we found out last year, it can be very wet and very muddy. But, from above and below, it's a little more interesting. So this is the satellite image of Carax. The most prominent feature are the ramparts, shown here. The northern rampart runs for approximately 2.4 kilometres, and the eastern one for about a kilometre. Of the western one over here, we haven't yet found any trace, and we're not sure if there was ever a southern perimeter wall. Down in the south, there is this huge U-bend here of a former river channel, and perhaps this marked the southern boundary of the site. The area enclosed by the ramparts and, and the river is, is about five square kilometres. Much of the interior is under cultivation, or has been until quite recently, and the main scatters of archaeological materials on the surface are here, around the outside of the river bend, a smaller area up here, closer to the eastern rampart, and an even smaller scatter up here, which we think probably represents uh, the remains of a single building. I'm going to start by discussing the ramparts, and then we will have a look at the interior of the city down here, before ending up at uh, this possible monumental building here. So, the ramparts. They survive today to a height of just over four metres. And they are the only elevation in an otherwise very flat landscape. And this and their proximity to the Iraq-Iran border attracted the attention of the military planners during the Iraq-Iran War of 1980 to 1988. So they have a lot of disturbances. Along the top, there are infantry trenches. Uh, you can still see the foxholes on the bottom right there. And there are larger areas that have been displaced where they've bulldozed, uh, um, bulldozed uh, emplacements for tanks or other artillery pieces. We are actually treating the Iraq-Iran war remains as the latest phase of occupation at the site, and they're the subject of a continuing study by uh, Dr. Mary Shepperson, who kindly provided the photo you can see bottom right. Uh, a stark reminder, I'm afraid, of a rather dark period in Iraq's recent history. There's not much left of these ramparts above ground, um, at least the top part. This, this is a trend, uh, tank emplacement that we cleaned up and as you can see there's just the earthen core here. If there ever was a facing at this upper level, it has long uh, since disappeared. Now John Hansman, who was an American scholar and archaeologist who first visited Carax in the 1960s and actually was the first to suggest that these ruins represented Carax Spasnu. He observed several towers of mud brick along the eastern ramparts, but we haven't been able really to locate those today. But he also made notes on three baked brick towers, which are still in place. And this is one of them. This has been the subject of uh, looting. Uh, somebody took a mechanical excavator or a bulldozer and dug a wide trench up to the edge of the tower. Uh, in fact, cutting down, cutting off the corner of the tower before tunnelling in through several metres of brickwork and eventually giving up without finding gold, no doubt. 
And what we have here is, in fact, the corner of one of these towers shown uh, in plan. You can see the corners being sliced off here. And here is the robber trench. It's about um, just over 11 metres along each side, and it survives to a height of at least four metres. We weren't able to excavate to the bottom of the tower. It's constructed, uh, at least in the bottom part, of solid brick, and many of these bricks are triangular, similar to the uh, larger examples shown in the photo. And that actually helps us with a date because elsewhere on the site we have a building that is partly constructed of identical bricks, which the occupation of which we can date to the mid-2nd century AD. So there's no reason to assume that this phase of the fortifications date to uh, any different uh, date any differently so second half, uh, mid second century AD at the on, along the top of the tower the robbers had also dug a vertical trench and in the side of it we could just see some vaulted bricks which suggests that although the base is solid brick there may be one or two uh, internal chambers at a higher level and against the external face, the, the, uh, eastern, the northern wall, northern wall face, there was this deposit of heaped up alluvial clay over three metres deep against the tower and sloping away, so forming a, a glassy. And you can almost see in, in that photo the individual shovels or buckets of soil that were just thrown up higgledy piggledy uh, against the tower. And, of course, this means that there must be quite a substantial ditch further out from which this material has been dug up. Now, although we were not able to locate the western wall, and we tried quite hard with uh, the geophysics across the line of where we thought it might be, we did find some evidence for an extension along the east side perhaps the, where they, the wall might turn south and come down here towards the river. And this is the geophysics plot of that. And you can see that there are two linear parallel structures. And the one on the east is the strongest signal and must be made of some solid material, of bay brick or similar. And it is at least 20 metres wide and has at 30 metre interval here two uh, projections which look very much like they might be towers or bastions. The uh, second linear feature on the left is, a, is harder to interpret, but we would suggest that here we have perhaps one or two phases of fortification wall, and this is an area we hope to investigate later this year. So, so much for the defences. What is it? that they were protecting. Now this is inside the city, down at the south end, where we have again this huge bend in the river. And it's where we have carried out perhaps uh, most of our geophysic, geophysical survey. We've covered about 50 hectares. And the defining characteristic of the urban architecture down here is its division into regular blocks. And what we seem to have here is the underlying grid, the so-called Hippodamian grid of the original Hellenistic city, although, although the remains are actually Arsacid. So what's happened is the original plan has been retained in subsequent periods and maybe even uh, expanded. The blocks get a little more diffuse down here, although the buildings retain the same general orientation. Now, these blocks are actually quite massive. Um, their approximate size measured off the geophysics is about 160 by 85 metres. And that suggests that they might actually be uh, specifically 550 by 350 attic ionic feet, which is the measurement that would have been used to lay them out originally. 
This makes them larger than comparative blocks from Seleucia, and the comparative sizes are shown on the slide. And, in fact, as far as I know, makes them among the largest, if not the largest, known from the ancient world. I must admit, I haven't checked every Hellenistic and Greek city grid to see if this is actually the case, but uh, they are certainly among the largest. Now, the orthogonal layout of these blocks dictates the street patterns because the streets obviously have to run around the edges of these blocks. There's a major street up here, which is about 30 metres wide, and we've traced that now for just over a quarter of a kilometre. And then subsidiary streets running all the way through at right angles. We have examined these divisions between the blocks in two different areas. And note that these are two different blocks quite a long way apart. And what we expected to find uh, in excavation was some nice, horizontal, well-laid streets. Street levels, I should say. Uh, But we didn't. Um, We appear, in both cases, to have a ditch that is, has a revetted bank on one side, the south side, and in that ditch there was a single row of very tall pots over a metre high. These had been placed upside down and the base is sliced neatly off. So what you're seeing there is not actually the top but the bottom of these jars. And they were packed in clay. And you can see here in the section we've got these typical sloping levels coming down uh, that that are really uh, indicative of of pit fill and not horizontal streets. In the second excavation, we, we found basically the same, except this time there was not one, but two, uh, and even possibly three rows of these jars set along one side. And the section drawing shows you that the top layer, then a layer below, and just the very top of this jar, which we didn't excavate any deeper, but we did put a ranging pole down it to check that it was actually uh, intact. On the north side of this ditch, here is a late intrusive wall, and that unfortunately masked what was happening on the north side here. So we have the same result from two different areas of ditch, if you like, and extrapolating from our sample, we estimate that there must be 2,000 jars set like this along just one side of one of those blocks. And obviously that means there must be tens of thousands of these jars lining the edges of the blocks at Carax. So it seems that the original Hellenistic streets must have become revetted ditches at some point, or maybe the sides were banked up. We're not terribly sure as to why. All we can say is that there are many examples from Roman Europe of amphora being used in a similar fashion, either as part of a drainage system or as a geotechnical feature to protect surfaces or to raise the ground level. We're not sure which of these applies here. It might be uh, elements of both. We do know, of course, that the city was flooded in antiquity, twice at least in the second, millenni- in the second century BC. And John Huntsman reported that uh, the local inhabitants told him that until the construction of the Wadi Thathar barrage at Samara, in 1956, the ramparts here at Karax were continually surrounded, well, yearly surrounded by the floodwaters. So obviously flooding was a major problem uh, at the site. From the bit ditch, we had some of our best ceramic material. That includes open forms such as the shallow bowls top left, sometimes with uh, lugs, a uh, tripod bowl, a, pe- a pedestal, a tripod bowl with incised decoration on the shoulder, a pedestal bowl, 
and closed forms here include steep-sided vases, uh, round-bellied pots, and a handle jug seen here, which was uh, completely covered in black, a black glaze. This material dates to the 1st to 3rd centuries AD, and the pedestal bowl here and the tripod jar are both examples of, of what is called BI ware. Now, BI ware was identified as such in excavations of scrappy Arsacid levels on Phylica. And it was obvious to the excavators that it was an import. And it's been suggested that this ware was actually manufactured and imported from Carax. So finding it here at Carax provides uh, some support for that theory, though it doesn't, of course, confirm it. Yeah, you may have noticed in the geophysics plot I showed earlier some large buildings up in the northeast part, and this is a, a detail of that previous illustration. On the left-hand side is the geophysics, and on the right-hand side is a preliminary plan of the same that has been uh, done by Lena Lambers at Leiden University, who has just started a project to map all our buildings. There's a major street I mentioned earlier here. You can see it in a little more detail. And it looks along the western side as if there's some sort of covered walkway or maybe colonnade. You can see an extra parallel line coming down there uh, we're not sure. The edge of the river is very clear here where it's actually eroded all the archaeological deposits. So this particular river course or flooding event must be uh, later than the actual archaeological layers. And then within each of the three blocks on the left-hand side, we can see one much larger and very distinct building. Most of these, if not all, I think, are actually later than the surrounding buildings. Uh, certainly, this is the case for building two here, because you can see that it is slightly skewed to the grid, and then around it is an area devoid of any walls, which must be where the ground was flattened and prepared for the construction of this building. And then similarly, building three down here is skewed to the grid. There may be another one up here, uh, but we're not so sure about that. If we take a look now at building two in more detail, on the left hand, top left is the geophysics plot. The bottom left is a grayscale with an enhanced contrast drone photograph. Uh, top right is, shows what well, shows the location of our evaluation trench here, and the plan bottom right has been uh, extrapolated from these different sources of information. What we have is a rectangular building about 45 by 55 meters. It would appear to have a staircase or entrance on the east side, as shown here on the geophysics, and. There was a central courtyard with a, a, with a single row of parallel rooms between the entrance and it. I should add the grey doorways are uh, slightly more conjectural. From the central courtyard here, there was a single row of flanking rooms off the north and south sides, a double room to the west, and then this rather narrow range here. And running all the way around the external part of the building before you reach the main external wall, this very narrow corridor. The narrow corridor seems to be a feature of Parthian buildings, and there's a little bit of dispute about what the significance of it is. But one suggestion is that it was a relieving wall relieving the stress of a dome that would have been over the central courtyard. Now, we did not get um, any 
diagnostic material from this building, so we do not know the date. And I don't know of any close parallels, uh, unfortunately. But moving now from a building of uncertain date and function to one where we have a much better idea, in the northern part of the city, close to the northern rampart, there's an area that has been partially very badly disturbed uh, by bulldozer activity. Uh, We are told that the perpetrator of this was trying to dig a well, but uh, I doubt that very much. You can see uh, the bulldozed heaps of tile and brick in the foreground, and there are even fragments of brick and plaster columns kicking around. From the drone photographs, we can get a little more detail. Here's the uh, bulldozer disturbance. There's another vertical robber pit here. Um, But it looks uh, as if this building might have a central courtyard here with ranges of rooms all the way around. This range of rooms in the north is particularly clear on the drone photograph. And from these, we thought we'd probably got a single building uh, covering uh, about about 14,000 square metres. And once we'd run the geophysics over it, uh, it became a lot clearer. And these are two plots of the same area. Uh, They've just been done at slightly different gradients. The white spaces are where we've had the bulldozer and looter activity, so we weren't able to run our machine over it. The clearest feature is this peristyle here, this columned courtyard. And you can even see on the geophysics plot the signatures of individual columns. And looking at this, we thought there were probably five circular columns with square ones on each corner. The range of rooms to the north is also clear clear here, as well as other ranges of rooms around the building. Here in particular, you can see two buildings off the west side, two rooms off the west side of the courtyard, one behind the other. Down here, there appears to be an identical pair of room suites. And also, there's some suggestion that in other areas of building, there are pairs of columns, uh, or maybe even uh, more. And the very dark rectangular bands here, here, and particularly on the south side, we would suggest are probably dense concentrations of uh, brick paving or similar. We excavated in three different areas. Uh, A small excavation down here in the southwest corner. We looked at one of the rooms in this range to the north, but our main concentration was down here in the southwest corner of the courtyard. Once we'd removed the topsoil there, uh, we found this, the top of a baked brick and plaster column. And you can see here, it appeared to have fluted decoration uh, along this side, which was indeed the case. There it is after excavation. This column is actually oval shaped. It's about two meters long and over a meter meter wide and it has fluted decoration at both ends and plain sides. While we're here you can just see in the corner here the edge of a circular column which is part of a doorway.
The column had fallen off its rectangular plinth. Oops, sorry about that. Here's, here's the plinth. And all this here is fallen column. We also found the next column along in the peristyle, again with a rectangular base. Here only the very bottom of the column has survived. And in the southwest corner, where we had speculated about them being square rather than round columns on the basis of the geophysics, we did, in find, we did indeed find a rectangular plinth. None of the superstructure of this plinth had survived, but there was, as you can see from the plan on the right, a plastered lip all the way around, which must have marked the base of the square column that was sitting on top. There was also uh, a doorway in the northwest corner here. Uh, a raised step led into, we think, the rooms that were shown before, one behind the other, along the western side of the courtyard. And just here in the corner, part of a column which must have formed part of the entranceway. The whole peristyle here was, uh, had a beautiful plaster floor and the areas between the columns had bait brick pavements which were then plastered over. In the area next to the entranceway here, we found over 50 fragments of very large iron nails. Whether these were part of the door furniture or perhaps they had fallen from first floor level, uh, we're not sure. Here's a reconstruction of one corner. The size of the columns, uh, they're quite large, suggests they must have supported an upper floor. But the upper facade here is, of course, uh, conjectural. We have, uh, I think this gives a good idea of the monumental nature of this building and uh, we think it probably does represent in fact uh, a royal palace at Carax Massini. There are two buildings that offer some comparison from elsewhere. The first is the Parthian Palace at Ashur. Uh, and this palace is actually smaller, slightly smaller than the one at Carax. And the obvious point of comparison is the peristyle. But it also has, uh, as you can see on the, on the left, a much larger courtyard. And that courtyard has these true iwans running off every side of it, i.e. rooms that are completely open on one side. And that's not a feature that we see in our palace at Carax. The second example offers a, a few closer parallels. This is the so-called little palace at Nippur. It is about a quarter of the size of ours, but points of comparison, obviously, the peristyle. And look at that, there's round columns with square columns at the corners, on the north side, there's a columned entrance into that suite of rooms, similar perhaps to the one we found. There's the use of columns elsewhere in the building, which again we think we can see at Carax. And off the south side here, there's the main reception rooms. And I suspect that that's also what we can see to the south of our courtyard. So plenty of comparisons with this particular building. Both palaces date uh, to the first century AD, though the one at Ashur continued in use and was rebuilt into the third century. But we can do better when it comes to dating hours through good fortune, really. Because sitting on the lower of two floors of this palace before it was abandoned or maybe demolished was a cache of 23 copper coins. They're all low denomination, calcoy and di calcoy, and many of them, as you can see with this example, have actually been clipped. 
But this one has a Seleucid era date. Uh, and that's comprised of three Greek letters. The first one here is an upsilon, and that gives us the hundreds according to the dating system, so that's 400. The second one under here is a xi, so that gives us 60, and the third looks like an alpha. So that gives us 461 according to the Seleucid era. And the Seleucid era starts in 311, and because the year starts in our autumn, we've always got a choice of two years. That equates to AD 149, 150, or 150. So we know this gives us a terminus post quem. We, we know the palace was occupied uh, sometime after this date. And this brings us neatly, really, to the later history of Carax because merely one or two years later at the most, Carax was attacked by the Arsacid monarch Vologaises III. There, there was a bit of a family feud, and uh, he, he actually got cross with his uncle, who was the king of Messenia at that time, and uh, deposed him. We know this from this chap here, the well-known weary Heracles of Messenia, as he's called, there's a Greek inscription on one of his thighs and a Parthian and Eastern Aramaic script on the other. And it tells us that in the year 462, i.e. 150, 151 AD, uh, Vologaises came down to Messini and he t- threw his uncle uh, Mithridates off the throne and banished him. And then he took this figure from Messini, i.e. from Carax Spasnu, he carried it off and set it up in the temple of Apollo in Seleucia. The Arsacid dynasty itself was overthrown some 65 years later by the Sasanian monarch Ardashir I and Messini was subjugated al Tabari, writing in the 9th century AD, reports that Ardashir killed the king, the last king of Messini, and then he fortified Kach Mesan, i.e. Carax. It's difficult to know which, if either of these two events, might correspond to the destruction of our palace. Carax Fasnu remained the provincial capital of, Karasini, of Messini through the first half, at least, of the Sasanian period. But it was supplanted by Forat in the early 5th century, the neighbouring city a few kilometres to the southeast, because we know at that time that Forat was the seat of the metropolitan of the Church of the East, so it must have been the provincial capital, and Forat was in turn supplanted by the Zubair or Old Basra in the 7th century. These changes in location of the provincial capital were brought about probably by the regression of the waters of the Gulf southwards and the silting up of the river channels. So both Karak Spasnu and uh, Forat in turn were denied easy access to the waters of the Gulf and uh, really lost their their raison d'etre. So it really only... So we started with Alexander and we have now ended with Al Tabari and really all that remains, remains for me to do is to acknowledge the support of these individuals and institutions listed here. I must particularly mention Baron Lorne thyssen Bornemisha at the Augustus Foundation, who provided uh, most of the funding for our first exploratory season, and the results of that enabled us to go on and make a successful application to the Cultural Protection Fund, which has been our main supporter since then. 
Archaeological projects are, by their very nature, collaborative efforts. And the work I've reported on here tonight uh, has really been the work of very many people, uh, my co-directors, our Iraqi colleagues, and all the team members listed here, some of whom are shown here in inextricably cheerful mood. My thanks to them all and to all of you for listening. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, wonderful to be able to explore a, a site and reveal it from, uh, from next to nothing. Um, there must be some questions. I'd like to ask some questions. Sir? Um, it was just a question of whether the streets with the, um, the pots beside them were really canals, and so, and, or not, could they be? Well, it would be very nice if we could demonstrate that because that, that, that's what we thought. But uh, unfortunately, we haven't really found any evidence of water laid deposits in the archaeological layers there. We haven't, we haven't reached the bottom of them. Uh, we had to stop. So, yes, it would be nice if, if Carax could supplant Basra as the Venice of the East, but as yet we don't have that, that amount of evidence. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. That was that was fascinating. On, on your website, you you talk about the monumentality of the of these two buildings and the fact that they are in size so much bigger than comparable buildings in comparable cities, even the Alexandria. Is that presumably a testament to the city's wealth? And the second part of the question is really about. The, the longevity of how long it lasted with the silting up of the river and obviously the regression of the coast, the change of the northern coastline, the Gulf. I mean, how much closer was it to the, to, to the coast? And when did that decline with the silting up actually begin? Uh, so the first question, the first part, uh, it obviously was a very prosperous and wealthy city and... and um, that's the reason I think that we've got these really uh, very large... Uh, blocks uh, and that we have these monumental buildings for three or four centuries it really was a thriving entrepot and, and there must have been a lot of wealth uh, in it, uh, accumulating there the question of access to the sea is quite a tricky one and it's one of the reasons we started this geomorphological survey um, there's some discussion about how close the sea was to Carax whether in fact uh, you had an area of marshes or river channels, a bit like the approach to Basra today before you got to open water. Um, and, uh, and when this event happened uh, and the rate at which the Gulf uh, moved south again, we're not terribly sure because although I, I said uh, that um, Carax was uh, supplanted by Forat at the beginning of the 5th uh, century, um, there is some evidence that it actually went on a little bit longer. Um, so it was a very gradual process. And uh, I think one of the aims of the geomorphological survey we're doing is to try and pin down when these changes actually occurred. Thank you very much. Can I just ask a question about the coins? Ah, you can, yes. Yes. Oh. Uh, there is that there is you can see that seated figure there yes. um, which I suppose might be Heracles or, or similar but um, there are some letters that are visible on the other side but the, the coins are very very badly corroded and um, really reading of any, any more of those signs is very um, dubious so I think all we're going to get from that coin definitely is, is the date. And unfortunately, uh, I think I'm right in saying that none of the others, or maybe one or two of the others, you, there, are, there are some things you can see, but only the design. No, um, 
No more, no more inscriptions. Uh, not, you, not really, not really. I can send you more details. Um, yes, thank you. Right. Yes. Uh, probably enough on the coins, copper, because suddenly rock doesn't have copper. Yeah. So it was No, 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 we haven't yet. Uh, but interestingly, the periplus of the Erythraean Sea, which I was mentioning, uh, specifically talks about uh, hardwoods, but also copper as being shipped up the Gulf to Karak. So uh, its likely source is always going to be Oman or maybe even a bit further afield, uh, India. But we haven't ourselves done any, any, any trace analysis. Come across any evidence of occupation during the Islamic period? Uh, not really, as such. There are there are scatters of Islamic pottery at various locations uh, within the city, but most of the Islamic occupation that we've identified belongs to the sites found on survey uh, further south, and a lot of those are quite ephemeral. It looked like maybe they're just one farmstead or something of that nature. Um. Um, from the from the moment of excavation that you've done, um, have you found much material just coming from far afield from India, um, like spoken about in Paris? Uh, no, not so far. Uh, uh, we have one carnelian or agate bead, um, which must have come from India maybe. We actually, uh, our um, pottery technologist got terribly excited last season when she finally found a few very tiny fragments of terra sigillata. So, yeah, but that is about it so far. Most of the work we've been doing has, has been concentrated on mapping the surface and uh, the ex- most of the excavations have been very narrow and quite small. So we haven't recovered a great deal of material so far. Uh, three questions. The first is, what would the population at its peak would have been? Uh, well, I don't think I can answer that one. Um, uh, I, I, really I guess the will do. Estimate. Ballpark figure? I don't know. 70, 80, 90,000? Okay, that big. Okay. The uh, other question is, uh, in the, you know when you spoke about the cul-de-sac corridor? And the, and Sorry, the, they... The, the corridor that, that was yes. at cul-de-sac, yep. Um, I've noticed a... Um, I was actually thinking why that was the way it was, but there's also two chambers that had no doors on them. Yeah. That, that's pre- actually... Because that's a, um, a hypothetical plan from what we can see from the geophysics, there are elements that are in doubt. So there probably is a doorway. It's just that we can't see it yeah. from, from the geophysics. Yeah. And the... Um, the uh, upside down pots. Oh, yes. Um, now, I didn't really understand fully where you were trying to take me um, in, in many respects, um, maybe because I didn't understand it. So the assumption is these were used as Gabian walls or sort of as retaining walls? or um, then there's Really, you've got a choice. You can either see them as some sort of feature to deal with sur- runoff from surface water, in which case you'd have to imagine that they perhaps dug all this material out, placed all these pots along one side, and then filled it all in again in some way, which, which seems to me a bit unlikely. And if you're looking at it from a purely archaeological perspective, we clearly have a ditch with a revetted bank on one side with these pots set into it, so that suggests to me that maybe the sort of geotechnical explanation is the more likely one, that they're simply revetting the side of, of, these, of these ditches. And maybe, as the other gentleman suggested, if they weren't canals, they were perhaps a way of channeling the water at, uh, when, at a time of maximum flood, if you like. We, all, we need to do a lot more work on them to really understand why they're there. 
Well, yes. Well, that's what, as I say, that's what you do get examples in, in uh, Rome, Europe, of them being used like that. So, yeah, I think that's probably a, a reasonable hypothesis. And did I, the final question is, did I understand right that they were exporting pot, pottery? Is that correct? <laughs> um, the BIOware that I mentioned, uh, yes, was probably travelling down the Gulf to Bahrain. Okay. Um, but I think the, the, these large pots that are all in the ditches uh, must originally have contained... Uh, you know, uh, goods that were being traded in the city um, and they're clearly reused. Yeah. That, that's, that's all my questions. Right. Thank you. My Thanks. If there are no more questions, uh, I'd like to say thank you very much for a stimulating and fascinating talk and I'd like to invite Dr. Tim Clayton to give a well, uh, thanks. I suppose the moment, uh, particularly fascinated by that rather fine figure of Hercules. Uh which gives you some sort of hint at what was, that city was really like. I, I take it very dull and boring now, but clearly in its time, an absolutely fascinating city. So I'd just like to propose a word of thanks, and thank you very much, Robert. My pleasure.